I didn't hear anybody uh, thank the new chancellor and the future leader of uh, UNC Asheville, Dr. Mary Grant. I'd like to thank Dr. Grant. It is indeed a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to talk with you briefly about ASCO. And I want to tell you it has to be brief, uh, but let me tell you the background of this brevity that I must uh, honor and follow tonight. Uh, as I was riding up the road today, uh, talking to someone whose name I may or may not call later, I was told, um, we're not sure that Dr. Gates' plane is going to be on time. And uh, if he is somehow late coming, you can talk for about 15 to 20 minutes. But if he's on time, you need to be real brief. Uh, fortunately, our guest speaker is on time, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be brief. It's a special occasion for me because anytime I get together uh, with the folks that I grew up with and the folks that I was fortunate enough to associate with in a score, then that in itself is an honor for me. I do want to spend a few minutes reflecting on ASCO, and I'm going to preface that by telling you that the official history of ASCO has not yet been written. And I know that because my classmate and friend, Dean Chambers, told me he was going to write it, uh, and that was about 40 years ago. So he's still working on it, uh, but we'll get there. But I do want to say, uh, in, all in, in, in all seriousness, that ASCO was not just a group of young people who got together and worked to desegregate public facilities in Asheville. ASCO was a very unique group of young people. ASCO, as far as we have been able to determine, and I'm going to say this tonight, and then I know uh, Dr. Gates is going to research it and tell me I'm wrong, but uh, ASCO, as far as we have been able to determine, was the only high school group in the nation that organized itself and formed to desegregate the cities where they were. And so it was a unique uh, entity in that sense, um, but it was also unique in this sense that the founding members of ASCOR, uh, like me, were not heroes. We were just crazy young people who knew something was wrong, and we wanted to straighten it out. That's what A-Score was all about. And A-Score really started before the sit-ins, although we became known for what we were doing after the sit-ins, which started in Greensboro in February of 1960. But we had actually started A-Score earlier in the school year uh, when the school authorities had proposed and actually adopted a plan to put some inferior additions to Stevens Lee High School, the black high school, up in the crowded space that we had there. And those of us who were in the senior class at that time recognized that there was something wrong with that. And we said, we got to correct that. And we joined together to correct it. And we met with the superintendent of the schools and the chair of the school board. And they all told us we were wrong and crazy. Uh, so we weren't getting anywhere. And we got some support from the Mr. Mapp, I think it was, who was president of the, the um, PTA at that time. He said, y'all ought to listen to these young people. Uh, but they still didn't want to listen, so we, we, we decided then that somebody was going to hear us. So we made it known to the principal and superintendent that either we would be heard or within the next week we would lead a, a, a walkout of all of the black students at Stevens Lee High School down to Lee Evans. The very next day, they met with us. And it was as a result of that meeting that eventually um, a new school was built for Stevens Lee High. I won't give you all of that history. But we came up at a time when we had no choice but to make some noise if we were going to make some change. And that's what we did in February of 1960 when the city, after the sit-ins broke out in Greensboro. We didn't have a black college here in Asheville, but we said we want to do something. And we got together with folks in the community who were supportive. Now, let me, let me say quickly, I don't want everybody thinking here today, uh, as we sit here in this integrated audience, that people came pouring from the woodworks to support what we were doing. 
they didn't, but there were a few people, adults in the community, who did embrace us and who did assist us. And I want to call some names tonight of those people because they're not here. Uh, the first name I'm going to call is Mr. Will Rowland, who ran Rowland's Jewelry. He was our closest advisor and met with us almost on a daily basis and sacrificed his business for a score. Mr. Rowland lost his business, but so courageous was he and such a hero was he that he didn't mind losing his business because he stood up for a cause. And I think that needs to be recognized and known. <laughs> Along with Mr. Rowland, there was Ms. Leah Butler, a teacher. There was Reverend Avery, the minister uh, down at Hill Street Baptist. There was Mr. L.H. McCord, a retired railroad worker who worked with us. There was Jesse and Julia Ray. And there was a Mr. Bill Bagley from High Point who worked with the American Friends Service Committee. And there were other adults who helped us. Um, but that was a time when what we were doing was simply not popular, to put it mildly. It was very unpopular. Our parents were our greatest supporters, but I can tell you our parents had to be more courageous than most because many of them, like my parents, were menial workers. My mother working as a maid in a white lady's kitchen, my daddy working on the railroad at the time, and they knew that there could be economic reprisals for their children marching in the streets to desegregate a city. But even so, and even though they knew the supreme sacrifice that they might have to make their job, their livelihood, they supported us in what we did, and they found ways to do that. And when, and when we talk about standing on shoulders, I stand on the shoulders of my daddy, who had a sixth grade education, but one of the brightest persons I've ever met in my life. And my mother, who had a high school education, but one of the wisest and most courageous people I've met. And I can say that for the parents of all of the A school people who are sitting here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reintroduce a score in, in my own way. Uh, those of us who were in the original a score group were my high school classmates. And although I was, the, I was called the first president of the group, any one of them could have filled that position because they were all leaders in their own right. Uh, so we take pride in the class of 1960, which was unique in many other ways than a score. But I just want my classmates who are here to stand. If I had the time, which I don't, I would give you all of the wonderful things they've done in life since then. Um, I would tell you that A score was an inspiration uh, and an education for all of us beyond the classroom education that we got. There also, I was the first president of a school, uh, but the second president of a school is here tonight. And not only was she the second president of a school, but she is the woman who was the first African-American student to go to UNC Asheville. Etta Mae Whitner, where are you? Could you stand up and let folks know who you are? And even if I were not obligated to do this, I would do this. I would introduce the third president of A School. Um, I do happen to live with her. So I have A School to thank for our coming together. So I want you to know A School wasn't all work. We had a little fun as well. Uh, my wife, Barbara, who was the third president of A School, is here as well. And there, there are other members of A-Score that I want all of those who participated in A-Score to stand again. You cannot stand too many times to be recognized tonight. So with all of the A-Score people who joined A-Score at any time, please stand and be recognized again tonight. And, and let, me, let me be true to the brevity I told you about earlier. I do want to say that what A score was about was really what I'll paraphrase from, from Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist. She, she said, never doubt 
but a small band of dedicated people. That, that a small band of, educate, of de dedicated people can change the world. Indeed, few others have done so. So it was a small band of young people and their adult supporters who joined together to bring about the change that had already been promised and had to come. That's what got us started uh, as a group of young people who were committed and determined to make a difference in our community and to bring about that equality that we had been promised as early as, as, as 1896 when they said we could be separate but equal. And again in 1954 when they said everybody has to be treated equal with all deliberate speed, and we saw a lot of deliberateness after that, no speed. Um, but that promise was there, and we were committed to seeing that change. And that change came, and it's still coming. It didn't all come at once, and it isn't here yet. And that is why I am so proud of these awardees who were awarded uh, uh, their honor tonight in honor of ASCO, the leadership. So for the young people tonight, I want you to know that though there has been change, there is much change that is yet to come. I won't go through all of it, but we see what's happening in America. Change is coming, and you are the agents of change, and I salute you for your leadership. A score made all the difference in my life. It was in A score when I first met the only two black lawyers in Asheville. Reuben Daly and Harold Epps. And we met with them as young people because we didn't know what we were doing. We had to learn nonviolence. We had to go to school. We didn't just go out and start picketing. We uh, learned, uh, tried to learn what we were doing. But I met Reuben Daly and I met Harold Epps, and I thought I was going to get the grand lecture on law and how the law applies and what you need to do and how to do it and this is legal and that's legal. They met with us, and it took about 10 minutes. And we told them what we were about to do. And we wanted to know what our legal rights were and what we should do. And together they said, you all do what you need to do. And if you need us, call us. That was the whole lecture. And that's what we did. And I got to scratch in my head. I said, anybody who can have that much power and influence and confidence is somebody I want to emulate myself. And I made the decision then and there on the spot that I would go into law and do what I could to lift others as I tried to rise myself. Uh, and if that has been the spirit of ASCO, it remains the spirit of ASCO. Indeed, it remains the spirit of the entire movement towards racial equality. It is the spirit I see every time I sit down in front of a TV and watch Professor Gates tell us about ourselves and tell us who we are and how we got there and what a proud people we are and what great achievements we have had. It's all about having that confidence in oneself to rise above one's circumstances and to do all one can do to make the world a better place. And that is what we were about then, although we didn't know it. And that is what many of us are about now. I'll end by saying that for myself and any other person with A school could tell you a similar story. For myself, I was, I've been fortunate to be able to devote myself to a law practice that has become uh, an agent of change, and is still that. And my wife has insisted that in two years, I think it is, in 23 years, 2018, that we have an observance of the 50th anniversary of the first racially integrated law firm in North Carolina, of which I was proud to be uh, one of the founders of. So I say that because I want to invite all of you to come. So, so thank all of you for coming out tonight uh, to give honor and homage to the Diversity Center so ably led uh, by my friend, uh, Deb Debbie Miles, um, and all that they have accomplished. And I want to say thank you to my A-score friends and colleagues, and I want to say thank you to the entire Asheville community for your giving us such a warm welcome tonight. Thank you very much.